So think about then, we take the us out of it. And just like the man in the mirror, it starts with me. So I look in the mirror. So let's like, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with her. <laughs> let there be peace on earth and let it begin with her. It's like, no, let there be peace on earth. And let there be change. And let it begin with me. So the power, all the innate inherent power we have and we hold that we have given agency for, full responsibility for, and innate inherent empowerment to say, it is us. And it's one thing to say, I'm only here for God. And you better not look at me that way. (laughs) And I'm only here for God. And it's all your fault. (laughs) This is the insanity of it. It's also the humanness of it. So this is a time, a high time. A liminal period. A liminal period. A threshold period for me. For you. For us. For this ministry. For the movement. For the time that we're in. A liminal period. Described as a threshold period. That we either cross a threshold... Or we stand and stare at the threshold and blame the threshold or blame what we're going to blame that stuck us here or say, okay, there's a threshold here, there's, a po- there's an opportunity here, and I have some agency for this. I have some authority in this. I have some responsibility in this. And then to act accordingly. And as I came in this morning, I was... <laughs> There may be some tears. Most of you know me, so I figure if you ain't crying, you ain't listening. (laughs) So I try to run in every place I'm going to speak and locate the Kleenex. And this is what I found. (laughs) I thought, have you ever felt this way? Like, what happened to her? She's been squeezed from all sides. Can you relate? And you know what else? She works just fine. You're just fine. You are extraordinary. Your divine human being, whole and perfect and complete in every single way, except the unquestioned patterns that are waiting for us to resolve, to question, and to say, okay, what is actually true? What is true here? And a part of our human instinct is to deny pain, to deny suffering. And I heard Reverend Denise last week or the week before quote me of saying how we traipse around saying, how are you? Fine, fine, fine. And it's like, well, you're going to need to tell your face (laughs) that you're fine because it has not caught up with how fine you are. Particularly if we've got a wagging finger and any kind of blaming going on. So it's one thing again to say I'm fine. It's another thing entirely to embody. I actually am. Yes, there's challenge. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, I feel squeezed. Yes, there's loss. Yes, there's grief. Yes, there's discomfort. And I am equipped and further equipping myself in that. And then a time then to deepen our own spiritual practice, whatever that is for you. I don't know what it is for you. Sacred dance, meditation, transcendental meditation, stand on your head meditation, cross your legs, uncross them, cuss meditation, have a tantrum meditation. Whatever is your spiritual groundedness, whatever will return you to the reality of your own divinity. Atonement. At And particularly in this West, in this part, and us that rationalizes in enlightenment, for example, we have a tendency to suppress, depress, and repress hurt. 
hurts. So we've got some excavating to do. And as I was preparing for this, Richard Rohr is one of my boyfriends. Jesus is a boyfriend. We're in a little threesome. (laughs) And Richard Rohr reminds me in the writing and the reading that I do from him daily that weeping was considered one of the highest sacraments in the early church. We're not talking a hundred years ago, 2,000 years ago, church. Weeping. And for example, St. Francis and Claire of Assisi often cried for days. For days. So only you know if you've got some crying to do. And guess what? Only you can do it. If I could ease it for you, we'd all be free. Because it would have been done a long time ago. But I can do it here. And it'll be up to you then to do it there. And scientifically, and I've written about this in two or three of the newsletters I've put out over the years, scientifically it's proven that every tear examined under a microscope has pain relief qualities, regardless of what the tear was for. Pain, sorrow, loss, gratitude, celebration, when our hearts are touched, and every tear was the same chemicals that we get off some of these drugs people are using to feel better or to not feel. But something that comes out of the brain through our tears that is its own healing property. So if you need to cry, cry some. And then I had a very significant loss of somebody dear, dear to me, a young girl. Um, This next, this July is three years. And it affected me in ways that shocked me, this loss. And I was guided through my own meditations and prayers to watch movies for 30 straight days. I know more than God, of course. And I said, I ain't going to do that. Something else. Give me another assignment. Watch movie. Watch a movie daily. Watch a daily movie. Watch a daily movie. It would not leave me. You know what I mean? So then when I'm done arguing with God, who needs some consultation from me, You know, who needs a God when you've got me to say how things ought to be? This should happen, this shouldn't. They they can do that, they can't do it. It's like, no, I'm not the director of the universe. Dang it. Guess what? Neither are you. See if you can say it out loud. I am not the director of the universe. There is a director of the universe, and it ain't me. It ain't me. It is not me. There is a director of the universe. There is a will and a way of it. And it will highly benefit me to awaken to the will and the way of it and to continue to surrender what I cannot change. So this is the period, the threshold of living in our empowerment, living in imagination, living in what we can cause and can create, and the absolute certainty of that power and that empowerment and the absolute certainty of a powerlessness. Things I cannot change. Things that didn't go my way things that I wanted a different outcome in, things I dreamed for, desired, prayed for, visioned, imagined, and it didn't turn out that way. Byron Katie would say, you know, it didn't turn out the way I wanted. It was perfect instead. Now, this can be a bitter pill, turned out the way it was supposed to. 
not the way I had in mind. So anybody that's experienced grief, and everyone has, whether we processed that grief or not, can attest to grief is not rational. It is not rational. And just like I was assigned to watch movies and finally surrendered and gave in, and I did that for 30 straight days. And it was at night, usually sometimes 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. When everything was done, I took it so seriously I would not go to bed until my assignment was complete. And the movies I watched were wholehearted movies about resilience and grit and loss. And my favorite part of the human spirit, which is resilience. Resilience. And you, Unity of Nashville, have resilience in spades. Get a sense of that in your bodies now. Yes, it's uncomfortable. What we have to go through, challenges are uncomfortable. They're not fatal. They're uncomfortable. There's a big difference. So get a sense of where resilience is in your body. Even when it's going, I can't. I just can't. That's one part of you that's saying, I can't. Another part of you knows the truth. It knows you can. It knows you can and it knows you will. And it knows you've been doing this for decades, for centuries even, and lifetimes depending on what you believe. So the simplest and most inclusive definition of grief is unfinished hurts. Unfinished hurts. So it can feel like it'll overwhelm us. Like we can't bear it. And I say, test it out. See if that's actually true. And we've been taught not only to suppress and depress and disown feelings like this, these big feelings like this, but we've also taught that it's better to be angry than it is sad. To be righteous, indignant. And what's the consequence of that? What's the consequences of your known consequence to, for example, speaking in anger versus speaking in honesty? Like, I'm going to speak honestly about this, even with the tendency to speak angrily about this. And this is the difference in power versus force. To speak honestly instead of angrily. The way you'll know when you've cried enough or shed enough tears or weeped in sacrament, weeped in surrender, is when your blaming is over. When the blaming is over, when you no longer will blame yourself and hate yourself and shame and guilt yourself, and when the blaming them, her, him, them, it is over, you'll know you've done enough processing, weeping, ranting, whatever, whatever it's going to take to move this energy through us transformationally, causatively, creatively. You'll know it's utter transformation, literal transformation, spiritual transformation, emotional pr- transformation, physical transformation. When your soul feels more cleansed, cared for. And when you realize God is in this too. 
There is no place God is not. If you believe unity teachings. Which is, there's one power and one presence in all. All. All of the universe. And it's one thing to offer that as a platitude. It's another thing entirely to embody this. So close your eyes if you can for a minute. Let's just journey through the heart, active here in the imagination center, imagining you with full embodiment of the principles of unity and what it would feel like to be living from this. God is, would you repeat these with me? God is, and feel it. God is, and feel that. I am that. I am that. I think this way. I pray this way. I live this way. God is, I am, I think this way, I pray this way, I live this way. So when you question then, what can I actually do in these matters, these times we're in? What can we do in the matters of ministry? What can we do in the matters of the world? Make a gift of your life. Deepen your own spiritual practice. Dr. David Hawkins, he's a former boyfriend, and I still got a great fondness for him. He had the audacity to die. He says, what can you actually do to be helpful to the world? Make a gift of your life and lift all of humanity through your consideration, through your forgiving forgiving and compassionate action in every situation, in all times, in all interactions, under all conditions, with everyone, including yourself. This is the greatest gift you will ever give to the ministry. This is the greatest gift you'll ever give for God. This is the greatest gift you will give for your own soul's evolution. Doable. Doable. This is not way out there. Do what we can. And I, I, I got a kind of a notion of what this is a living spirituality, not a conceptual spirituality. Not a platitude spirituality, but a living spirituality. And I read where this professional group was looking at the power of love and what love actually is. And they asked four-year-olds to eight-year-olds what love actually is. A living humanity, a living spirituality. What is love? And here's some of their answers. When my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. Talk about hell. <laughs> so my grandfather does it for her now, all the time. Even though he has arthritis too. When someone loves you, 
They say your name differently. You just know that you're safe with them the way they say your name. You've all realized this, who your persons are, who your people are, where you feel loved. Love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. (laughs) It's a little too true, ain't it? Remember, we're just a hair above an animal. (laughs) Love is when you go out to eat and you give somebody most of your french fries and you don't make them give you any of theirs. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him just to make sure it tastes okay. Love is what's in the room at Christmas. If you stop opening presents for just a minute and just listen, love is in the room. Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know everything about each other. During my piano recital, I was on stage and I was so scared. I looked at all the people watching me and then I suddenly saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that. But I wasn't scared anymore. Love is when your puppy licks your face, even though you left him home alone all day. This is why we'd rather be with our pets than people. (laughs) The mammal brain, which is way above the reptilian brain. You really shouldn't say, I love you, unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. And the final one in the winter was from a four-year-old child whose next-door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. He saw the man crying and the little boy went over into the gentleman's yard, climbed up onto his lap and just sat there. When his mother asked him what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy said, Nothing. I was just helping him cry. So we may need to help some of us cry. The Holy Spirit then is what makes us spiritually alive. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, to this interaction. Come, Holy Spirit, to this exchange. Come, Holy Spirit, before I fire off that email. Come, Holy Spirit, before I roll my eyes three times in a row. Come, Holy Spirit. So that very poignant pause to presence ourselves and to decide how am I going to be in this situation? How am I going to be in this interaction? So liminal space is the uncertain transition period between where you've been and where you're going. What you've been and what you're becoming. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, All dimensions, all aspects of that, and metaphorically. So to be in a liminal space is to be on the precipice of something new. Something new. And when I ask most people in New Thought, how many of you like change? Most people will throw their hands up. I'm like, tell your face. (laughs) Because... We're in some change, and it's very, very scary at times. Now, we're naturally prone, 
We're naturally wired, we're naturally empowered to create, to cause. The imagination is a power for that, not to mention the others. Faith, love, will, understanding, strength, all of it. And the power of imagination. So pause then and begin to imagine as we close to begin. What will you imagine for yourself? What will you imagine for this ministry? What power will you send through your imagination to what we can cause and create and co-create and collaborate together? What unfinished hurts are you willing to clear to make room for what you prefer? what you actually want. Peace or pain. Crossing the threshold, equipped to cross the threshold or stuck in blaming, shaming, guilting, whatever the flavor of it is. Or exercising this. You hold the power. You hold the power. I'm starting classes Tuesday night from this book. It was on your announcements and up here. It's called I Am God, Wisdom and Reflections from Mystical Consciousness. And this is the one I was guided to this morning. Until now, if I am God, then I am everywhere. I transform humanity with love, joy, creativity, compassion, and awakening to hasten this new era, to hasten this new era, this new time, Everyone needs to be of God. Everyone needs to be God, of God. Cradle every crisis in a manger of love. We are how spiritual evolution happens, which is why it has been so slow. Until now. Would you say that with me? Until now. Until now. So join in if you want to. You can find out other offerings I have through MarthaCreek.com. And there's hundreds and hundreds of videos on that YouTube channel. And it's my highest privilege to be here in service to you. In service with you, I have a tremendous heartstring for decades for Unity of Nashville. I sincerely love you, and I know who you are, I know what you are, and I know how you serve. And I am here uplifting all of it with you. Together we can do what we cannot do alone. Blessings to you.